Welcome to the My Haunt Life Podcast. Hello and welcome to the My Haunt Life Podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Russell. And now that Fringe is over, it's kind of nice to not have a zillion things going on. Yeah. <laughs> so even though uh, I've been a little bit busy during the month, it is definitely a slower pace than last month. Oh yeah, you've done a ton of stuff. This bit is basically going to be you talking the whole time. <laughs> Apologies to the listeners in advance. It's it's going to be the Russell show a little bit. That, that yeah. There's a joke there somewhere, but... <laughs> So the first thing that we've done since Fringe ended was the finale of Dark Arts. Dark Arts was a trilogy uh, with two immersive experiences and then a traditional play that happened at Fringe Fest. And that was written by our friend Larry, who we met in Tension and is now participating in Lust. He's living up the plant life. And in the prelude, it was a immersive experience where we met two of the characters and then the we got to see a little bit of their background so the show dark arts at fringe the traditional play made a little bit more sense and now this is the finale of the aftermath of what happened at fringe yeah actually yeah that was exactly it <laughs> nice job <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah it's, it's a really unique experience the fact that there were two immersive experiences surrounding a traditional proscenium play uh, i thought that was a really unique approach and the play worked on its own. You didn't need the, the, you know, the prelude and the finale. But the depth that they added, I thought, was really, really nice. Oh, definitely. It, and it, it's cool for that extra that some people may have wanted, you know, just to see more character development and get inside their heads a little bit. And also, I thought it was very interesting. And, and like, this is something which, you know, it, it's, we've talked on this podcast a couple of times about how formats are changing you know, immersive theater is, you know, where are the boundaries and how much do you interact, et cetera. I thought this was a really interesting experiment along those lines and the fact that you did interact. The prelude was heavily based on information you provided on your own life. And, you know, we talked about that in podcast. I was surprised by that. I think you were too. But the finale, wow, man, it was, it, it was stepping into their universe. It was as if you, if the play had ended it and then you immediately stepped into their lives. Yeah, I was really, really impressed with the finale. Um, you know, with the the fir at the prelude, it was three three actors. I, I know you had met four, um, but in this one, this was the, you're right. This was a world. You know, you walk into a hotel lobby, you're greeted by uh, their new employee Morgan, and then you know, I had a conversation with the reporter, and then I spoke with two other people that gave you seeds of information that you could have planted when you met with. Andy and or Lindsay. Yeah, I had the same conversations in the lobby or, or not the same conversations. I encountered the same people you did in the lobby. And I thought that was a clever thing that they that when you got into the meat of this, when you went upstairs into the hotel conference rooms and this was staged in an actual hotel and you actually went into the conference rooms where meetings had been taking place. It was very clear the the uh, residual effect of a bad meeting <laughs> was very evident in the first room. And when you interacted with them, you had the choice to bring up the stuff that was mentioned to you in the lobby. And I thought that was a really clever, I, I was about to say trick, but uh, right. a, a, a technique, method, I don't know. Yeah, uh, because that it could go so many different ways and it shows you how many like endings there could possibly be. And from talking to you, Mike, and talking to a few other people, apparently there were multiple, multiple endings to this. Oh, yeah. And I totally understand why. Because every time somebody brought up one of those pieces of information, their entire relationship could shift. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we are talking about um, uh, Lindsay and Andy were having problems in their relationship. And during the play, which was uh, produced and presented at the Fringe Festival, uh, Lindsay did a questionable business move. And in this finale to Dark Arts, you kind of explored that with both of them, of whether what she did was unprofessional, whether it was forgivable, uh, whether she did it out of business manipulation and tactics, or whether she did it out of love. So... 
all of that was fascinating and all of it held for me mike a really huge emotional toll oh yeah definitely uh, how did you behave how did you use that information uh i didn't use it at all i didn't even bring it up interesting because i i did bring some of it up in the fact that i thought um because i met with andy first and i mentioned that i had been approached a couple of times in the lobby and and i sort of did the like hey just to let you know like business wise you've got vultures circling your business and they're all in the lobby right now <laughs> And I said, you've got people looking at you thinking that this is the end of who you are and there's people who want to take advantage of your next step. And so I didn't, I didn't do it necessarily the way the people in the lobby presented it to me. What I did is I just, I just want to make you aware that this is happening. And then when I got to meet with Lindsay, that became a whole different matter for me because she was asking me really personal questions about my conversation with Andy. So what I chose to do there was not bring it up because I made it about her and I made it about what she was going through and her problems. And this was a completely, I want to stress this to the, the people who are not lucky enough to do the finale. This was a completely immersive conversation. Like I, I was there in the room and they were asking me business advice and relationship advice and all of this. And that was fascinating, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, like I keep going back to the other I word, but like impressive, like it was so impressive. Um, you know, and that's not to like take anything away from Larry, but you know, from going from the prelude to seeing the show, like, yeah, they were good, but the finale was on another level. Yeah, absolutely. It was. And if this is where they currently are, I can't wait to see like what they do for something that like the next thing they do. It, to be totally honest, I, I don't know what I, I let me ask you a question. Uh, do you want to meet these people again? Um, I don't know. I, 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 it, it doesn't matter to me, you know, based on how my show ended, you know, I wish them the best, but I don't, I don't know. Like as characters, like I don't think I need to, unless there's, another story ah that's interesting because my show and your show we've talked about this your show ended with them coming to some sort of agreement or arrangement correct they got back together yeah i wouldn't say that's an agreement or an arrangement <laughs> but um in my show they did not get back together and it was a just devastating thing to watch as you know, this couple who obviously had gone through hell together in both business and relationship form break apart. And I was standing in between them and, and, you know, to see him walk away down the hallway, deserting her, it, you know, it saddened me and it pissed me off. But I will say this, it also leaves me hungry for, I, I'm the optimist so I want to know if it really is the end. I want to know if these two characters do meet in a month or six months and work something out. I don't think it's going to be tomorrow. But yeah, there was this sobbing woman on the floor, you know, and he deserted her. And, and I just it was just brutal to watch. Spoiler, by the way, even though the show is no longer running. <laughs> um so I actually would be interested in meeting these characters together again and seeing how they interact. That's, but I mean, if, if he deserted her quotation air quotes, <laughs> why would you want to see them together? Because like, I want to know if it really is the end. Well, wouldn't you have your answer if you only saw one of them? You mean at that finale? No. Oh, you, uh, in the future. Oh, in the future? Maybe. 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 Okay. I, I, <laughs> I am forever the optimist. <laughs> I can't believe that the cruelty that I witnessed was the end. Even though it was the end of your show. Who hurt you, Mike? <laughs> I think you know. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so yes, uh, the Dark Arts finale, I thought, was of everything that we've been following the Dark Arts with. 
you know, the immersive thing in the bar in the beginning, uh, that little meeting, uh, the bar thing you did, you were, I think, working or something that night. You, you were not able to attend that. I think that was the weakest because I thought it was the least focused. But, you know, it, the, the progression to that final emotional moment I thought was really well done. And, and I think the tone of the actual play at the Vringe Festival was very uneven. It kind of careened between sincere drama and wacky comedy. So that that was a little uneven for me, but man, they nailed this finale. I thought it was just wonderfully, wonderfully emotional. Yeah, I agree. I definitely want to see something next from these guys. Yeah. And um, kudos to the entire cast, by the way. Mm-hmm. Everyone, everyone helped sell the the entire world. And usually this is where we'd give information on the website and all of that fun stuff. But since the show is over, this is our opportunity to shame Larry to get a website up for Ichabod's Cranium so we can send people there and they can post about stuff coming up. So make a website or a Facebook or something. Come on. Larry, seriously. It's 2017. We're trying to support you here. When dogs have their own profiles on Facebook and Instagram, you can make one for your company. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> we love you, Larry. And so um, you went and became a party animal. <laughs> uh, I have that reputation. Totally. No, I don't. <laughs> I can't pull that off. Um, yes, finally. It's very funny because um, Drunken Devil is sort of a brand name. Uh, Matt Dorado, the man behind Drunken Devil and his team, Uh, have been creating themed events now for a couple of years. Uh, Their original, uh, what was it, two years ago, I believe? I think so. Yeah, that they did uh, the Drunken Devil Haunt. And it was a haunt which ended in a bar. And the devil is a character that is sort of the, the logo character of Drunken Devil. And they kind of created this atmosphere where it was a New Orleans themed haunt and you went through the haunt and you ended in a bar and you were able to sort of drink and party with the devil and what has developed is he's now doing themed events and it just so happens mike i actually i think we've joked on this podcast about this every time he has thrown an event i have been out of town finally mike one landed where i was actually in town Woo-hoo. So the name of this particular event was Curse of the Jungle Drums, and it promised a tiki-themed party with immersive theater elements, with burlesque and magicians performing, and a band. Uh, It was located at a a space that here in Los Angeles, many of us know uh, what used to be the Think Tank Gallery, which is sort of an art space in downtown Los Angeles. And... It was a open bar for the evening. You bought a ticket, and it sort of just opened this entire world. So now as far as the event itself goes, I, I think the key here is, are you interested in the theme? And the whole tiki theme, the whole jungle drum thing didn't speak to me personally. If you were into that, and trust me, there were people there who were into that and completely dressed up in costume and, and all of that, I think if you're into it, it's completely worth investing in the world. I think that's the key with the Drunken Devil for me in the future will be, does the theme interest me? Because the burlesque performers, I'd actually seen perform before. And of the magicians, we knew, uh, we have seen one of them perform before. And I was able to see um, another that I hadn't seen up close before. So uh, it was, it's just a huge freaking party. So with a certain theme. Now the immersive theater elements, I think worked fairly well if you were aware of them. And I think if you probably bought into this, you were aware of them. I walked in and immediately, uh, the first thing I did was I, I, you know, the, I went and was going to go get a drink and in the the line waiting to get a drink, uh, this man turned around and he had a bullet hole in his forehead. And the theme, the mythology that they had set up is that this tiki-themed bar, uh, a haunted idol had been brought into the premises and had driven patrons mad and that they had killed each other and they'd all died. And this party was being held after that event. So this man had been shot in the head supposedly during that you know crazy incident where everyone went insane. Uh, so he told me his backstory, I believe, oh, I hope I got his character's name right. Antonio, I believe was his name. 
he introduced me to a woman whose throat had been slit. And so you have these sort of undead characters roaming around in the party. And if you spend a couple minutes with them, Mike, they would give you their backstory. They would tell you who they were and what they, hap- what they happened to be doing there that night. And I, um, I thought it was really interesting. And I thought it was a really nice piece. I don't know if this was preset or was improv, Mike, but I got in a conversation where the character I just mentioned was an actor and he introduced me to his lady friend who was an actress. And they started riffing on the work that they had done together and what motion pictures they had appeared together. And the, they were so on point with the titles. They were coming up with all of these titles and sequel titles and prequel titles. It was actually really, really funny. And I don't know if that was, it felt completely original and improvised. And if it was, wow, they were, they, they were on it. It was really enjoyable. And I, I have to point to my favorite interaction was uh, a character named Grace who pulled me aside. And this I thought was a fascinating story she was actually a suicide and she had come upon the scene after all of the death and destruction had happened and because of a situation that she was in she had actually committed suicide and her suicide was sort of hidden among the death and destruction of this event and i thought that was a really touching sad moment and she she told me about her brother that she had left behind and and you know was worried about him so it was this really touching beautiful moment in the middle of this weird party and she had pulled me aside into this really quiet corner to tell me the story i thought that was for me that was like the loveliest moment of the night for me was like i got this really intimate sad story and so that you know so like that was the event was sort of that was the structure of the whole night um so there were a lot of pluses there and i think if you were into the theme that's great. Like I think it was worth the ticket price. The the downside of this for me is I'm not that much of a drinker. So an open bar, I don't get my money's worth. Right. It's it's just a like cost and effect thing with me. Uh the immersive theater elements weren't massive or huge. The performers fine, but like I said, I in this particular case I'd seen them most of them before. So it was a mixed bag for me personally, even though I thought the evening completely was a success for Drunken Devil. They delivered exactly what they said they were going to deliver. So I think for me in the future, it will be if they offer something, whether I go or not will be completely based on how interesting is the theme for me. So I, I, because I I think this was a really successful event for them. There were hundreds of people there, by the way, Mike. Oh, wow. That's awesome. It was packed. Uh, the the uh, another downside for me and this is just a personal taste thing the band was deafening and so what i noticed is there were there was like the band was in a center space area and i noticed that the two outlying areas were extremely crowded most of the night because it was people trying to get away from the loud noise to talk so but that's kind of like on the acoustics of the space that they were in and there was a really dark corner in the very, very back of this. And I, and actually, that was where Grace took me to tell me her story. And it was very funny because you walk into this dark corner where you would think nobody would be there. It was packed in that corner because it was people trying to find a place where they could talk to each other. So and that's just a personal thing with me. I hate screaming at somebody to have a conversation. And if you were in that center room, everything was deafening. So there were people trying to adjust to that around the space. And also, uh, there was a noise complaint and the police were called. Wow. So the party actually got shut down a little bit early. And my confusion over that, I never learned quite exactly what happened. But this is an industrial, pardon me, an industrial-ish area in downtown Los Angeles, right? Yeah. So the when we found out, like, like suddenly all the lights went on and there were people with flashlights ushering us out. And, and when we learned later, it was like, oh, the police actually had gotten a noise complaint. It was like, wow, in the middle of that area in downtown L.A.? Yeah, that's strange. It, it seemed very, very odd. And the concern would be Think Tank is such a, or formerly Think Tank, I don't know what you call that space now. Um, if... If that event can't hold late night, loud, raucous events, if that venue can't ho- host that type of event, 
I'm not sure what the future of that event is because it's such a great space for that. So, and also there have been haunts in that. You know, Screenshot has used that. Alone has used that space. So, you know, does this bode ill or well or does it even affect the future? So that was kind of an odd ending. But um, as, as far as I'm concerned, the Drunken Devils, you know, Curse of the Jungle Drums was a success. Didn't really speak to me personally, but... Like, there were hundreds of people there having a great time. Awesome. So that's how I'm going to look at this in the future, is depending on their theme is whether or not I'm going to buy in and go. Right. So congratulations on the event to Drunken Devil, by the way. Good. And the drinks were good, by the way. I just want to add that. <laughs> they had a whiskey drink that was particularly tasty. Cool. For more information on Drunken Devil, you can find them on the web at thedrunkendevil.com, on Facebook, The Drunken Devil, on Instagram, The Drunken Devil, on Twitter, Drunken Devil underscore CA. And Russell, you returned to have a dinner with a, a family, <laughs> the that, family that we met previously. Uh, yeah, Mike, you and I had talked on this podcast. We attended a dress rehearsal for a show called The Willows which is a very immersive piece where you go to the home of a particular family and you enter a celebration. A celebration and sort of an honorarium, I guess, would be the way to put that because somebody has passed away, leaving a void in the family's life and your life because you knew him. So you go to this event and over the course of a couple of hours, you spend time with this family honoring Jonathan, who has passed away. And along the way, you find out that this family has a lot of quirks. And I went back, and I must say, it's such a unique, at times intriguing, at times creepy, at times thrilling show. And this time they, they, and I guess if you let them know in advance, cause uh, they knew that I had gone to the dress rehearsal, I was on a different track. So I met different family members. Oh, good. And I saw more of the house this time too, which was interesting. And I learned more about the, uh, I, uh, last time I was there, I sort of learned about the peripheral, like uncle Ricky was one of the characters that I learned about. And this time I learned more about the attitude of the, the matriarch and, um, Lindsay, sort of the, the family servant who I know knows everything. And I gotta say, Mike, this, this was worth the return trip. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. This was, it was much creepier for me this time. And I will say that there was, um, one sequence in particular where uh, I was taken upstairs with a couple of other people with one of the more childlike characters and um, Conrad uh, took us up to his room and you really caught a glimpse of someone who he's not a bad kid, but he's also not quite right. And to, to kind of see the, the layers of that peel away in, in such an intimate setting was really interesting. And um, I got to play the game in the back room, which I'd heard about. <laughs> uh, I didn't go outside and do the outside stuff, which I think you did at the dress rehearsal. Nope. Oh, I thought you went outside at one point there. I went outside, but not just to go into another entrance. Oh, I missed that then. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so there's, I found this definitely worth going back. I think they've made the show a bit creepier. I think it ran a bit smoother than at the dress rehearsal, which is totally understandable. Um, I think all of the performances in this show are really rich and powerful. Uh, during the dinner table, I sat next to um, uh, the grieving widow. And let me tell you, she was so raucous and rowdy. And... Uh, <laughs> It was it was quite pleasurable interacting with her a couple of times. So definitely definitely worth returning. And uh, the Willows, I know they've just announced uh, August dates. I don't know if those are sold out yet, but uh, it's a it's a reoccurring show. They uh, announce and they release blocks of tickets, and you just need to get on their mailing list to kind of get the heads up as to when those will be released. 
So I definitely recommend returning to this mic. Definitely. Nice. So I know you said they made it a, a little bit creepier, and but was it the same general story that we saw? Yes, it was the same general story. Cool. And I also want to make one observation: is like we, you know, Mike and I talk about immersive audiences, and I just want to tell you a kind of a humorous story for me. There was this this guy at the table, like at the beginning of the show. And it's funny because I got to admit, I was kind of prejudging him in one way. Okay. He was this really, he's a, he was a big guy and, uh, he seemed a little uncomfortable and I thought, oh, that's like, he's not, he, he's not into it. He's not, I wasn't sure what was going on with him and he wasn't really close enough that I could have a conversation with him. So, but I just looked at him a couple of times and I, and I thought he was trying to figure out, there was a lot going on around him and, and he seemed, uh, he, he didn't seem to be engaging a lot. And so he was one of the people that I got led up to Conrad's room with. Boy, was I wrong. Like he was so into it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and the thing that, that, that was really funny was, um, I don't want to give away exactly what happened, but Conrad does this really odd sort of like, let's pretend moment. And he picked that guy as a partner to kind of go through this conversation. And Mike, oh my God, this guy was awesome. <laughs> he was so into it. And he, he played off of Conrad so well, and he was asking questions and bringing points up to Conrad. And I was just watching the whole thing going, wow, I was completely wrong about this guy. He's 100% into this. And I think it was, I, I think it was because also, uh, and I will say this, uh, this house does not have air conditioning that the show is performed in. <laughs> and boy, did I go on a hot night. Oof. Uh, they actually were handing out fans to people because the, the, warm, the, the warmth was getting to a lot of people. And um, I think that's what was going on, was I think just at the table in the beginning, I think we were all just getting used to the stuffiness of the house and all of that. So, but, and I saw that guy a couple of times later in the night, and, and it was just like he's, uh, he was so into it. And I was just like, wow, like that was wrong of me to kind of like look at him and go like, oh, man, I, like, I don't think he's into this. I don't know if he's having a good time. And he was completely having a good time. <laughs> So I was really happy to see that. Good. Just, just an observation where I was wrong about someone. Well, that's never happened before. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so um, like you said, make sure to get on their mailing list so you know when tickets are on sale. And to do that, you can sign up at creepla.com. Find them on Facebook at Creep Los Angeles and also Instagram and Twitter, Creep Los Angeles. So while you were at the Willows, some interesting things happened within the lust world. Mm -hmm. um, and it was funny because as soon as you got out, out of the willows, it's like, so I just got told everything that happened over the last couple hours. Yeah. I walked out of the willows and, and somebody approached me and went like, Oh my gosh, in, in case you haven't noticed a lot happened while we were in that show with lust experience. Oh wait, hold on. Yes. A lot's happened with the lust experience. <laughs> Lust. Oh, yeah. Okay, now, now we can really start talking about it. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So, a couple podcasts ago, we mentioned, you know, we made a joke. It was like, last week, three new ARGs started, you know, and one of them was the Midnight Commission. And the Midnight Commission had a Facebook and an Instagram, and they were posting ciphers and puzzles. And at one point, they said, they gave a date, and... Uh, I forget exactly what it said, but I think it was like, what, the first 15 that solved this get in or yeah, something? Yeah, there was a cipher to solve. Okay, so that's that. And also, you were somewhat indirectly involved because they used your voice for something, right? The Midnight Commission was asking questions along the lines of, tell us your deepest fears. And if you figured out information, and eventually they just posted a phone number, and people were apparently calling and ask, answering these questions. And this gets into a weird conversation, Mike. You know, I didn't do that because I didn't know who the Midnight Commission was. But a lot of people apparently just jumped in 
completely revealing tons of personal information, which, okay, I, I'm just not going to do that. So I, I kind of like was liking and following their Instagram. And then when the cipher started, I became a lot less interested just because that's me. But you have that book now. So yeah, I, I do have a book <laughs> that a friend gave me for my birthday, so, uh, which I do appreciate. And by the way, I have used. Just, awesome. Yeah, I have used that. I, just, I don't know if I've ever said that to you, but no. <laughs> I have used that book. <laughs> Sweet. So um, I used it with a different uh, theater company. And uh, the thing about Midnight Commission was they, they kept asking these questions and ciphers, and, and I was sort of vaguely following, but I wasn't jumping in yet because I wanted to know more about them. And then they said... They, they had posted their telephone number and they asked the question, can we count on you? I went, okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to say yes. So what I did is I called and I went, can you count on me? I think you can. Because I didn't know what they were asking. Well, oddly enough, that, that clip of my voice was used in the next video where they did a montage of voices of all of these people saying, absolutely, bring on the darkness. You can count on me. I'm in, hook, line, and sinker. So that kind of sets up a reveal, right? <laughs> That's an understatement. And a half. <laughs> Take it away, Mike. Um, so while all of this was going on, I was at Brian Bishop's because uh, Megan was in town. So we were just having, you know, getting together, talking, nerding yeah, out I'd about things. Yeah, I stopped by uh, to see Megan. Uh, we're, we're friends on Facebook and have been chatting. And uh, so I just dropped by. And so I missed this at Brian's because I was actually in the willows while all this was unfolding. Yeah. And a periscope happened and it was a man talking and all of the people that got chosen, uh, they posted a list uh, earlier uh, in the day or the day before. And we saw all of those people just sitting around in, in like kind of a big warehouse. It looked like a warehouse. And all of a sudden, the man goes, and now we're going, you get to meet your leader of the resistance. And Morgan walks in and gives a little spiel about everything. So now Morgan is a character. Right. So the big reveal is that Midnight Commission was actually part of the Lust experience. Right. And Morgan, who has been playing as a patron, I guess, for lack of a better word, is now suddenly leading this resistance, mm -hmm. which sort of ties in to the BOS, I guess, of last year. So, yeah, that, that was a fascinating reveal. And I think a lot of people were upset. Yeah, there was a lot of mixed reactions. Because I, I think everyone was like, well, wait, wait, uh, how long has Morgan been a character? And like, and, and look, I'm friends with Morgan. Uh, I didn't see this coming at all. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I'm fine with it. More power to the Lust experience. I thought this was a really interesting twist. I think some people felt duped because they had liked the ciphers of the Midnight Commission and they thought it was yet another ARG. Except here's the thing. And it's one of the reasons I just pointed to, I was kind of hanging back because I didn't know who the Midnight Commission was or even what it was. Was it going to be a live event? Were they, were they teasing a show that I could buy a ticket for? They didn't do any of that. They didn't reveal any of that. So I, that's why I didn't jump in and also because I'm not a big cypher guy. And I think some people were upset. They're like, how dare you dupe us? And my attitude toward that was, wait a minute, you jumped in hook, line, and sinker without knowing anything so the fact that you're you know were kind of tricked by this that's your fault was it underhanded and devious a little bit absolutely but like why would you give all of that private information to someone that you don't know anything about which is also one of the huge overlying lessons that we learned from the tension experience but giving the information has nothing to do with the reveal like no. that, like that doesn't matter. Like people were upset because, you know, like some of them were over lust. They wanted something new. It's like, oh, this looks interesting and intriguing. And, you know, they tried to walk away from lust and only to be right back into lust. And it's like, oh, I thought this was something new. But them jumping in and giving information doesn't matter because they would be doing like people would be doing that no matter what, like because there's always going to be something new. And 
if you want, and like we've learned with all these ARGs, if you want to play, you have to give information. Yes, which I think is part of the point of the Midnight Commission. And like, and yeah, I I do see the point, and I and I and I think it is a little iffy that that you know people who had you know who were not participating in Lust and didn't want to participate in Lust were sort of pulled into this, but they went willingly. And so the reveal, yes, the reveal was a surprise, and now they get to walk away again. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I. Look, I think it's buyer beware here. It's like if you're going to jump in, you have to realize that, you know, you you might be jumping into something that you don't want to jump fully into. That's why I didn't jump fully in was because of the ciphers, not because I thought it might be something else. Um, I tried to solve a couple of their ciphers and I failed miserably. So I don't know. I you know, it it I understand the point of why some people were upset with the Midnight Commission and the reveal, but I think you do have to go to the fact that, like, look, you willingly jumped in. I I, I don't think it matters. Like, I I don't understand what you're saying. Are you jumping? Are you in, saying that this was unfair? Jumping in doesn't matter. Like, because you're gonna jump in if you find something interesting. They jumped in based on what they saw. Mm -hmm. So you can't fault people for jumping in because. You know, we've all done it. Yes, I have done it. So when the rug gets pulled out of them, I'm not that's not their fault for jumping in. Like, it's not their fault at all. I, 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 I hear what you're saying. And may, I don't know, maybe I'm not expressing this well. Um, you know, I, okay, we, we know a mutual friend that went that really wasn't participating in lust. He found Midnight Commission, like, intriguing. Right. How is that his fault for finding something intriguing and going and jumping in and participating? I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. But you just said it's your fault for jumping in and for being when you get upset. I, I'm saying that you don't have the right to be upset by... A... Yeah, you do. Okay. You totally do because it's misrepresentation. I do see your point. I do see your point. And yes, I, I think they have a little bit of a right. All right. Maybe the, maybe the question mark is why did they get invited to that event if Lust was aware that they didn't want to participate in Lust? To get them back or try to. I think that's a really questionable tactic if that was Lust's purpose because I would be completely turned off by that. Right. So, yeah. It, look, I know that this is a sticky situation and... I'm I'm not saying that those people should be blamed for anything. That's that's not my point. Maybe I expressed this really poorly. But my point is you can't jump in fully and give a whole bunch of information to someone that you have no idea who it is and then if they reveal themselves to be something that you don't want to participate in or someone that you don't like is behind it, mm, it's still partially on you because you jumped in but it's not. Yes, you know, it is. It's not your fault. If you, okay, if there was like this new thing, and you're like, "Wow, this looks really cool," I'm gonna sign up. And then you found out someone like you don't like is running it. Like you're saying that that's your fault for finding something intriguing, even though what you don't like about it is the person running it. No, it's it's not my fault at all. But that's what you're saying. You're saying it's their fault for jumping in and walking away like upset no it it wow am i really this incoherent <laughs> no it's it wouldn't be my fault at all however when i found out they're like oh wait you know what i didn't like their last show i'm just gonna stop and i'm not gonna give them any information right and that's, that's all there is to it and it's not my fault but you're saying pe because people jump in and gave all this information it's their fault for like walking away because they didn't know enough. No, it's not their fault for walking away. They should walk away if they don't want to participate in lust. Absolutely, they should walk away. Now that they know that the Midnight Commission is part of lust. But you can't be pissed off at being duped. Yes, you can. You totally can. You're the, like, no, no, I yeah, disagree with you. I, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, earlier you admitted you were wrong, so we have that on tape. So <laughs> we can just replay that. So, ah. because, okay, here's the thing. 
there's a new haunted house and it looks so cool. And we go and it turns out to be a My Little Pony convention. It's misrepresentation. We have we yeah. have every right to be pissed that it's not what we thought it was. Right. I see that. How is that any different? Because the whole point of Midnight Commission was to make the point that people were jumping in fully. Is it? How do you know that, though? I don't know. Then wh- how are you saying that as the whole point of the Midnight Commission because was this? Because that's what it seems to be. But that's what it seems to be to you. Yes. That's not what it is. Okay. You know, I see it as it was a story point, like, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, because there was there was talk in the forums about like, you know, copycats and blah, blah, blah. And it, it falls into that. Right. You know, but like, I don't know. We just look at this differently. Yeah, I, you know, I, and, and look, I, there's a couple of other things out there right now. There's other ARGs that we've mentioned on the show that I am holding back. Like the way I did with the Midnight Commission. I'm not jumping in fully. I'm not giving any information. And partially because I've been burned. I mean, you know, go back, <laughs> what was it, four months ago that there was a big splash by someone who you had to fill out the questionnaire and the questionnaire had send us these links that interest you and you had to point them to things on the internet and all of that. And then come to find out after lots of people did that, they then made announcements like, oh, you know what? We're not quite ready and we're having some problems with the show, so it's not going to arrive. And I felt duped by that because they led me to believe that by filling out that application, I could possibly have the chance to participate in something cool. And they weren't even ready. And yet they were gathering all this information. I felt duped by that. And it's one of the reasons I didn't jump into the Midnight Commission. And it's one of the reasons I look at a few of the other things out there right now, and I am not going to jump in and give them a ton of personal information until they prove themselves worthy of my trust. And I think, for me, trust is a key word in there. So, I, I look, I see both sides of the Midnight Commission thing. I just think people should be a little bit more cautious. Yeah, well, I don't know, but... I'm moving on. <laughs> We've talked enough about this part. <laughs> so, yeah. And so as, as far as the Lust experience goes, a uh, huge plot twist. Uh, there is a resistance movement. Uh, there have been recent shenanigans, which you can read about at the various other, uh, like, recaps uh, that they are providing. And uh, the story is definitely developing. Yeah. And I'm not done yet. Okay. Be- because as soon as that Periscope ended, you know, I mentioned that was at Brian's his doorbell starts ringing off the hook. I guess that's the closest thing I can say. <laughs> like, it was just like, ding, 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 ding. And there's someone named Joyce that has made an appearance and she visited Brian. And so I got to meet Joyce, you know, I, it like, and because Megan was there as well. So I feel like this was something for them. I was just an innocent bystander, but it was, it was really cool to, to be there while something was happening and just observe you innocent yeah so it was cool so she she talked to brian and brian asked her if if i could record it and she's she said no but um you know brian and megan i recorded their periscope afterwards and they explained it all but you know it was just really cool because she she came in all pissed off and like got in brian's face like how long have you known did you know like about the morgan reveal and everything he's like i didn't um and then she did a little bit of that and then she took megan into the bedroom not as fun as it sounds um and and just had like a private conversation with her about um you know if she could trust her if she's on her side and things like that and um yeah it was cool and then while that was happening like i didn't want to take away because I know it like that was not for me. So I went and waited outside for a bit. And as she was leaving, she was like, it was nice meeting you, Mike, and walked away. And I was like, oh, that's nice of you. <laughs> but it was, it was cool to, to get like to be there and witness that. Cool. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I guess. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So that's everything like I, I had. So yeah, so for more information on The Lust Experience, you can find them on the web at thelustexperience.com, on Facebook, The Lust Experience, 
on Instagram, The Lust Experience, on Twitter, Lust underscore experience, and for The Midnight Commission, on Facebook, Midnight Commission, and on Instagram, The Midnight Commission. Which, one last thought about The Midnight Commission, I think it's going to be interesting to see in The Lust Experience if The Midnight Commission continues as sort of a voice of the resistance. Like, how, how are they going to incorporate The Midnight Commission as part of the story? I think that's going to be interesting. Right. I just hope there's still people from Team FE representing. <laughs> Don't ever let it die. Speaking of dying. Yes. Uh, how about that Book of the Dead? Oh, dude. This is one of those things. We're about, we're about to talk about something that I saw last night, actually. And some friends and I from work went together and saw this play. And Mike, uh, I just, like, <laughs> this is one of those things that I just want to thank you. Okay. Because our friendship is a series of events now where... <laughs> I was like, hey, do you know anything about this? And then you'll say, hey, do you know anything about that? And we just just giving each other stuff like, hey, check this out. I think you'd be into it. Hey, check that out. One of the things you introduced me to was the Maverick Theater yep. in Fullerton, California. A couple years ago, you – and it was it was one of those cool things where you literally just said, you're doing this, damn it. Save this date. We have tickets. You're going. I don't think I swore. Is it, oh, probably not. I swear more than you do. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> so, and I loved it. And it was a live version of Night of the Living Dead, which is a tradition that the Maverick Theater has been kept, kept going for, for years. And I loved it. Well, the Maverick Theater, I went back to last night, Mike, for Evil Dead the Musical, which they have mounted a production of that. And it is wonderful, Mike. Awesome. Yeah, it's like this this theater company is so full of passion and love for this type of genre of like like paying tribute, you know, making the homage and yet poking fun and enjoying and and that's what you, the Evil Dead is. Um so now you and I have seen a version of Evil Dead the musical in Vegas, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to draw a couple of comparisons. Uh, this is a better version than is running in Vegas, in my opinion. Oh, awesome. Uh, for several reasons. One of the reasons is the Vegas version completely plays on audience reaction, and they play it over-the-top campy. And they play it as sort of like a black box affair. And what I mean by that, like a black box theater where there there is almost nothing on stage other than the performers. Well, this production at the Maverick is it they have a full set. Uh it it's a it, they don't it's definitely a campy version, but they don't overdo it. The the wink wink nod nod nudge nudge sort of attitude is kept in check enough that everyone's in on the joke, but they never ruin the joke by saying we're not taking this seriously. Uh, the cast is wonderful. The cast is like every performance in this cast is pitch perfect as far as nailing the wow, like this is campy, but let's go for it. Uh, this is a wonderful production of Evil Dead the Musical. And there is a splatter zone, by the way. Uh, my friends and I were not sitting in it, but it got splattered effectively. And the actors had a lot of fun with that. Uh, uh, the the everything from the props to the handling of the costuming, which in Evil Dead the costuming is definitely part of the humor. Uh, th this was just a wonderful, wonderful, fun night, man. I just had a blast. That's awesome. Was it in the same area where they had uh, Night of the Living Dead, or was it in that bigger area? No, it's it's the same area. It cool. was the same theater. Uh, and what Mike is referring to is the theater has sort of like two separate performance spaces. And this was in the traditional performance space. How much splatter was there? Uh, for my taste, there could have been more. Of course. But uh, they, they did it very well. They handled it very well. There, there was a couple of moments. Uh, in particular, one moment with Jake got like, the biggest laugh of the night, I think, involving, in, involving 
a certain bleeding moment that he had, <laughs> which almost every cast member has a bleeding moment of some kind uh, in Evil Dead the musical. So, uh, like, the band was great. The performances were great. The set is beautiful, uh, small but effective. Um, th- this was just... This is definitely... I've seen now, I think... Um, one, two, three. I think I've seen four different versions of Evil Dead the Musical now. This is probably the second best. Wow. The best being the New York off Broadway production of it, which I saw. And uh, but yeah, this this is this is up there. This is a fine production of this, and it's running for a few more weeks, so people have a chance to to definitely go see this. And also, I, I want to say that the theater is really nice, and the fact that it has a nice rake to it. So mo- there, there's really not a bad seat in this theater. Uh, the audience was completely into it. There were, there were people with fake hatchets coming out of their heads and things like that in the audience. That's how enthusiastic the crowd was. Uh, so definitely a good time was had by all, that's for sure. Cool. And by the way, Evil Dead the Musical, damn, those tunes are catchy. Like, I was, I was singing all the way home. <laughs> Particularly Cabin in the Woods, for some reason, always gets stuck in my head, which is the the opening number of Evil Dead the Musical. So, um, yeah, it, like really, really enjoyed this. And I, I just, you know, thank you for making me aware of the Maverick Theater because as I was at work and somebody said, hey, did you know somebody locally is doing Evil Dead the Musical? And they pulled the website up. And when I saw their name, I, lo- I turned to the person and went, buy tickets right now. Nice. And that's how this whole group kind of like started to form. Like we, 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 you know, like there were six of us together and it was awesome. Cool. And for people that want more information, that website is? They can go to mavericktheater.com, Mike. In which way is theater spelled? Uh, the traditional T-E-R.com. Sweet. And find them on Facebook at Maverick Theater. So that's been everything that we've done. Well, everything you've done and a couple <laughs> things I did. Yeah, it's uh, definitely, uh, I will say that I feel like I'm still recovering from Fringe. And you know what? Hey, Mike, we should mention the Fringe Festival. There have been extensions of some of the shows that won awards at the Fringe Festival. And we would highly recommend everyone go to hollywoodfringe.org. And look at the schedule for the dates upcoming through the rest of this month because there are shows which uh, have gotten extensions and there are a few performances left, uh, including um, The Spidey Project, which I think I'm going to check out this week, Mike. Uh, Dead Boys got an extension, which is a show that I wanted to see during Fringe Festival and didn't get a chance to. I'm going to go see that later. Um, Blamed also got a couple of extended performances, which Mike, you and I both really like that show. So uh, go check out Hollywood Fringe. There are still some shows that have extensions and performance dates through the rest of this month. Highly recommend you go out and support the Fringe Festival. Yeah, and on top of that, Zombie Joe has a new show, um, yes. Brave the Dark, and we did this last year, and it was one of those like, oh my god, like this is amazing. It's not a production of the same show they did last year. This is all new, apparently. And uh, looking forward to going see, to seeing that as soon as I can fit it in. That's what she said. Uh, um, yeah, and you can find more information on that at zombiejoes.com. Also, in another room, tickets went on sale, and it's already sold out. Yes. And that was one of the ones we mentioned a few weeks ago where it's like all these things started in the same week. Um, you can find them on Instagram in another room. And you know what? I, the one thing I loved about In Another Room is everything on their Instagram was just building backstory. And some of the images were so beautiful and creepy at the same time. And I love the fact, Mike, that when they released tickets, they were very explicit about, look, this is the show. This is what the show is. This is approximately what the show will run. The, as far as time goes, and they also explained the number of patrons per show. They explained, uh, they make mention that even though their their Instagram has been dark and creepy, this is not considered a horror show. I love the fact that they just put all that information out there. That's actually kind of refreshing, and I really appreciate it. Well, they do it all for you, so. I know, I know. Okay. Um, and then there's something new, you know, again, we talked about all these new Instagram things happening um, in the past few weeks. There's another new one called Inkwell. Um, no idea what this is. And it's ink underscore, 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 maybe one or two more underscores. Uh, well, um, 
and they started following us and left us like creepy messages on like old photos so where there was one word on one photo another word on another photo and i don't know it was yeah weird. i'm not sure what this is and uh but it makes me wonder because after the whole midnight commission thing it seems like they took a shot at the midnight commission and lust in one of their posts they they did because they like posted a shot of the def definition of resistance or something yeah and, and so my question is like why would you do that Right. Um, so is this a resistance of the resistance and part of lust? You know what I mean? Like, or is it something new where they're just not fans? Right. Which, which if, if they are not part of lust, I think that was a misstep. Yeah. Because so many people I know who are involved in the lust experience are now completely convinced that Inkwell is part of lust. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And, and again, you know what? Uh, prove yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Bold words, Russell. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I feel. So yeah, that's that's everything. And next week is Midsummer Scream. The week after that, Scare LA. Mm -hmm. um, if you see us, come say hi. And I don't know. Yeah, say hi. <laughs> <laughs> you sound so indefinite about that. Yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> people hate us. And I, w I don't want to give them the option to... <laughs> To say, so just only one option. Just so, say hello. So if you're going to be friendly, say hi is what Mike is saying. And yeah, give Russell hugs. <laughs> Russell likes hugs. <laughs> and with that being said. Um, Go hug Mike. No, please don't. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to end this. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us um, and not give Russell hugs, <laughs> you can email him at Russell at my haunt life with two S's and two L's you can reach me and Mike at my haunt life.com with two S's and two L's <laughs> and you can find us on the web at my haunt life.com on Facebook and all the other social media at my haunt life with two S's and two L's and you can leave us a message or shoot us a text on the hotline 515 haunt LA and that's with two S's and two L's so thank you for listening We'll see you at the conventions. I'm Mike. And I'm Russell. See ya. Is this conversation coherent? Mm hmm I think so. <laughs>